I remember this race from 1958 vividly. Like thousands sitting on the main straight, we waited for the field to appear for the first lap, but nothing happened. Then a few battered machines straggled out of turn four. A terrible accident occurred in turn three, caused by an idiotic move by a loopy driver named Ed Elysian. Trying to lead the first lap from Dick Rathman, Elysian spun, causing a metal shredding 15 car pileup that tragically killed the popular and talented Pat O'Connor, who was on the threshold of a great career. Oddly, in this sanitized report of the crash, although O'Connor is mentioned, his death is ignored. No doubt the sponsor was trying to paper over the fact that American racing was at that time gruesomely dangerous. These were perilous times. The men in these big, fast, ungainly race cars had iron you-know-whats, as you will see. Time goes by, and as it passes, comes the final toughest test. Here the finest come to battle, and the victories to the best. Yes, victory to the best. For only the best run here at the Indianapolis 500. From the time the Speedway opened race morning at 5 o'clock, 200,000 people from every state in the Union and 18 foreign countries have been pouring through the gates. This once-a-year spectacular fills the grandstands that frame the track with fans who have reserved their seats months in advance. The Purdue University Band parades the colors along the main straightaway. The music, the crowds, the cars are all part of one great show. The marching rhythms of the band beat out the last few minutes of a year of waiting for the drivers. For Al Keller, 38 years old, fourth year at Indianapolis. For Paul Russo, 44, and a grandfather, 12th year at the 500. Unser, 26, rookie. Thompson, 36, sixth year. Cheeseburg, 31, second year. Goldsmith, 30, rookie. Amick, 34, rookie. Boyd, 32, fourth year. Bettenhausen, 42, 13 years. Bryan, 31, seventh year. The traditional balloons rise into the sunbright sky, signal that the start is just moments away. The crowd becomes still. Tony Holman, Speedway president, speaks the words that bring the waiting to an end. Gentlemen, start your engines. to begin. The fans come to their feet as 33 high-powered machines begin a parade lap around this, the greatest race course in the world. The cars pile out of the pit area onto the track to form the traditional 11 rows of three abreast. The back straightaway and the cars bunch together. The three cars that belong in front are not in position. The first three cars had pulled out of the pits ahead of the pace car and must get around the track and into position before they cross the starting line. The third turn. The second row drivers still in front are holding back the field, waiting for Rathman, Galician, and Reese. The fourth turn and the front row cars squeeze around the pack and into their starting places just in time. They're ready for the start. Here they come. And the race is on. Through the first turn, 
turn. Dick Brathman out in front. Elysian right behind him. Through the second turn, Elysian cuts below the white line, but Brathman holds him off. Elysian is wheel to wheel with Brathman. Going into the third turn, he passes. Look out! Elysian has lost control. Brathman is forced into the wall. Slow motion cameras capture Pat O'Connor hurtling over Jimmy Reese. The track is blocked for the rest of the field. Three other cars spin to avoid the wrecks. And a fourth. Watch it! He's rammed by two more. Look out! There goes another! In split seconds, a total of 14 battered racing machines litter the treacherous third turn. The remainder of the field work their way through the wreckage of the worst collision in Speedway history. In the pits, mechanics are baffled. Their drivers should have come around long ago. Some of the cars are pushed clear of the track. Others must wait for the tow truck. Paul Russo brings his number 15 Novi Special into the pits under its own power and reports to his crew what has happened on the third turn. The smashed radiator may mean he's out of the race for good. What is left of number 97, Dick Brathman's car, is towed clear of the track. Number 97 is one of eight cars that were totally wrecked and are out of the race. Gene Marcinet, mechanic for the Novi, is ready to call it quits. The driver, Russo, calls for tools. He wants to get back in the race. and he's ready to go. He pulls back into the race in last place without a chance to win, but the determination to go the distance. After 18 caution laps, the track is clear and the green flag signals for high speed. Brian in car number one is in first. Bettenhausen in number 33 is second. Eddie Sachs is third. Bettenhausen and Sachs fight it out down the backstretch. Bettenhausen has hauled up on Brian, and entering the fourth turn, he stands on it and charges into first place. Here they come down the front straightaway. There's a new threat. Amick, a rookie, in yellow number 99, has taken third. Bettenhausen is pushing the pace to 141 miles per hour. As the leaders battle their way around the oval, Brian's crew waits. Can their car run in front? Only Brian has the answer. Out of the fourth turn, Brian jolts the throttle of his DeLon special and passes Bettenhausen on the outside. Rookie Amick comes up fast on the inside, passes Bettenhausen, and makes his bid for first. Brian, riding high on the groove, dips down to hold the lead. for front position is between the three cars in the field with a new low silhouette. Coming onto the main straight, it's Amick out in front. Brian, low on the inside, noses ahead of Amick into the turn. But Amick, riding faster in the groove, comes into the second turn on top.
of them, also in a car of new design, is crowding Brian for second place. Brian and Bettenhausen charge down the main straightaway inches apart. But where's Amy? At 118 miles, the terrific pace has brought Amy, the first of the leaders, into the pits. Starting in 25th position, Amy has had to charge all the way to run in front. A sensational effort by a driver in his first 500 try. With Amy in the pits, Johnny Boyd in his flight number nine takes over third place. Jim Bryan wheels into the pits. He gives Bettenhausen first place while he makes a precautionary tire change and refuels. Bettenhausen is driving hard to widen the gap. Brian wants to get out and go. The Ballon Special pulls out with three fresh tires and fuel in 29 seconds. Where's Bettenhausen? Now, Bettenhausen gives the lead back to Brian to make his pit stop. off the fourth turn and heads for the main straightaway. 40 seconds. Forty-five seconds. And Bettenhausen finally gets away. Can he get back on the track before Brian comes around? As he guns out of the pits, Brian roars by to hold first place. Still in third, but moving closer, Boyd, Lead puts it in the Bose Special. Brian and Bettenhausen in a fierce duel for the lead. Boyd, now only seconds behind. The terrific pace brings Boyd into the pits. His plan had been to run the 500 with one less stop than the competition. Brian and Bettenhausen blister the track and precious seconds take away for Boyd. Thirty-seven seconds and Boyd pulls out, still holding third place. He has a job to do to catch the front runners. These are the lonely miles. After the first pit stops, 125 miles down, 375 to go. The band settle back to watch the hours take their toll. It's just a matter of time. This is the test, the challenge of nerve and stamina. The next 150 laps grind more rubber into the brick and asphalt, burn more fuel supplies down, drain more strength from weary muscles. Through the monotonous, brutal miles, the leaders set a torturous pace. After three hours, only 14 cars still running. Christy and Mike McGill lose control. Twelve cars now. The leaders pit for the last time. Less than two minutes separate the first four positions. Jimmy Rathman, Dick's brother, comes into the pits too fast and spins on the apron. He decides to go around again. The last lap's on one. Crew members lean over the pit wall to watch and worry. There's a fire in the pits. Spilled fuel burns in the cockpit of car number 59. The safety crew works frantically to smother the flame, burning only inches away from the fuel tank. MC Wilson has to get out. The car's through for the day. Only two more laps to go. Jimmy Bryan is still holding on to first place. 
Hamick, only 30 seconds behind, is turning his fastest laps in the race. Boyd is 12 seconds behind him. There's the white flag pointing at Brian. The last lap, only one more lap to go. Here comes Brian down the straightaway for the checkered flag. And he wins the 42nd Indianapolis 500. Rookie Amick finishes second. Johnny Boy finishes third. To run in front and stay the distance is the challenge, not only to the men and machines, but to the industry which services them. Jimmy Bryan has won $105,000, his share of $305,000, the biggest purse in 500 history. This is a dream come true. From this testing and improving come the cars we drive today, and the new cars of tomorrow are already on the way. Looking onward to the future as new goals are made and set. Still the challenge lies before us, and the challenge will be met. Tragically, 16 of the drivers in the starting field in the 1958 Indianapolis 500 would eventually die in race cars, including a lesion, the winner, the truly great Jimmy Bryan, and second place finisher George Amick, as well as Jerry Unser, the older brother of Bobby and Al. One man who did survive, essentially unnoticed, back in 16th place, was a 23-year-old rookie from Texas named A.J. Foyt. 